morning to our listeners and uh, our distinguished speakers from overseas from the west and to many of our colleagues in asia good evening maybe a uh, late evening for you today is a very very special day for us for asian hepatology colleagues it's a day which i think is for the first time that we have the editors of three of the most prestigious journal in our specialty to have come together and hepatology is the ultimate name that people have for publication of journals in the, in the name of journals in the field of liver diseases and i had the distinct pleasure of having dr david cohen who had supported us for this venture and i immensely thank professor cohen for making this even possible thank you david he actually also brought the idea it was not my idea it was his idea that he could get the editors of the two sister journals i am not saying sister in this sense they are little less i am saying sister in the sense that they came after uh, hepatology so hepatology communications by gyonge azabo uh, and uh, liver transplantation by dr robert brown so we have three editors in chief today who are going to moderate what has been the best of the best publications in hepatology in 2020 we also have a unique honor of having five very distinguished speakers which were chosen uh, broadly by the editors of hepatology each one of them is a celebrity not because of the name but because of the work today we all in asia bow our heads we respect your time we respect how early it is and it takes a lot of time to prepare such rather unconventional talks with these few words and my personal gratitude to each one of you i think we have made a beginning and if the hepatology and aasld the staff so particular if they agree maybe this event can continue year after year but the credit goes to david and thank you all for making this i like my senior colleague masal if you would like to say words of opening and good wishes yes uh, hello uh, exactly 10 months ago we had a two patient american patient from the diamond princess suffered from the covid-19 our hospital managed to save their lives then after two months they went back to the florida if they died they might be first americans who passed away in the world since then almost 10 months in my hospitals i was involved to take care of the covid patients in fact today in tokyo record high although small number compared to yours but 600 patients got infected today and i'm very happy to hear that now the vaccination started in america i hope we can get soon but for the time being under those pressures i'm very glad to have all the people uh, distinguished a panelist and moderators coming from the join us to our pastoral meetings so i really try to enjoy i hope you enjoy and these these circumstances thank you very much over to david and please continue thank you very much um i would like to just get back to my first slide uh i began by um would like to begin by thanking professor Sarin and Obata for uh the and and all our Apazo colleagues for the privilege of uh being able to present this uh symposium. Um this will cover our journals that publish original uh articles and um what I'd like to do is give an overview um of the journals briefly and hepatology uh in in particular uh and then pass off to the other editors um so they can give you an overview of the journals then we'll have speakers um each covering highlights of articles published in the AASLD suite of journals 
um, in each of five different areas of expertise by experts in those fields who are members uh, of our association. And what I hope we'll accomplish by the end of the symposium is to give you the highlights from 2019 and 2020 published in these journals to show you that these journals look for, seek out the best in hepatology, basic and clinical science, um, and really welcome you to submit to these journals. We really, uh, APOSL members are an important part of our authorship and readership, and we welcome your submissions and we welcome your participation in the journals. So this slide shows you the four journals that make up the suite of AASLD journals. We have hepatology on the left, hepatology communications, liver transplantation, and clinical liver disease. Today we're highlighting articles from the first three journals. These journals publish original research. Clinical liver disease publishes multimedia reviews that are really excellent for both the basic and clinical practitioners in our field. Um, we invite you to explore this journal. It's a wonderful experience um, and it really gives you very beautiful, concise summaries of, of where the state of the art is in a variety of uh, disciplines in hepatology. So the hepatology, the our, our journal, we like to think our flagship journal, our original journal is Hepatology. It has a vision to serve as the premier publication for the dissemination of knowledge and for discourse within the specialty of hepatology. Our mission is to publish the highest impact advances in liver research, to synthesize concepts in order to foster the application of new knowledge to the study and cure of liver diseases and to promote robust dialogue around basic translational and clinical observations in hepatology. So the scope of the journal really is to be the premier publication in the field and as such to publish original peer review articles concerning all aspects of liver structure function and disease. These are the disciplines that we publish in. They're listed here. If you look in the table of contents uh, of the journal, it's organized in this way. And this way we like to draw your attention to the major topics in liver disease in the field and the original articles that we publish in each month in these disciplines. <clears throat> we have a variety of types of papers that we accept and publish. Some of them are, about half of them, are initiated by the author. They require no invitation. Their original research, rapid communication, our letters to the editor, clinical observations, observations in hepatotoxicity, and special articles. The other articles in orange font are by invitation only. So our reviews, editorials, uh, comments on, uh, uh, on, on papers published in other journals, etc. We do welcome um, uh, suggestions for these kind of articles, and that can be done by correspondence with the editors. Our review process, just to give it an overview briefly and hopefully demystify this a little bit, we have many submissions, almost 2,500 per year uh, of original articles to the journal. Because of space constraints, we can only accept 9%. About half of our manuscripts are rejected early without external peer review and rapidly in order to return these papers to the authors so that they can make a decision about their next journal. But many of them, and this is very important, are referred to hepatology communication or liver transplantation as, a, as perhaps a better venue for publishing their papers. So we, we welcome your submissions. If we don't feel they're appropriate for, hep for hepatology, we'd like to think and consider them for our other journals. And we have mechanisms for cascading these manuscripts to the other journals that are convenient for the authors. We send out about half of the manuscripts for peer review. Typically there are two reviewers Sometimes we scrutinize them for statistics. 
and about 20% are invited to su submit a revised manuscript. We allow one major revision, and those manuscripts that are rejected are offered transfer to hepatology communications, and in some instances, liver transplantation, together with the reviews so that they can be considered at the other journals in a facilitated way and hopefully get their, these publications out to the hepatology community through one of these other journals. In an effort to really be representative of the hepatology community, you will see that our editors are distributed throughout the United States and throughout the world. So this map shows you where our editors are within the United States. And here we have representation in Europe and in Asia. Drs. Trauner and Garcia Pagan represent us in the European community, and Professor Ng and Lee represent us in Asia. I would like to acknowledge Professor Hong Weang Lee, who's one of our moderators today. He's been an associate editor since the beginning of our term and has helped us identify and connect with many main members of Apazel, and we're always working harder to extend that reach. So with these comments, I'd like to introduce the next editor, Yanji Zabo. Professor Zabo is Chief Academic Officer at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, a Harvard teaching hospital in Boston, and the Mitchell Rabkin MD Chair, Professor of Medicine and Faculty Dean at Harvard Medical School. Her laboratory studies cellular and molecular mechanisms of inflammation and innate immunity and liver injury to identify therapeutic targets fo focused on NASH and alcoholic liver disease. She is a member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences and fellow of the AASLD, AGA, and the American College of Physicians. Dr. Zabo serves on advisory boards of several federal agencies leading academic institutions and pharmaceutical companies. Dr. Sabro has served the AASLD with distinction on the governing board as president of the association in 2015, and she is the inaugural first editor-in-chief of hepatology communications. Professor Sabo. Good morning. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Cohen, and I'd like to thank Apostle for the opportunity to give this presentation. So hopefully you all get to see my screen now and PowerPoint about hepatology communications. So hepatology communication, as you know, is the new journal of ASLD. And uh, we aim to be the top choice of open access journals for authors and readers in basic translational and clinical hepatology. The journal was started with the first issue in February, 2017 and uh, um, our scope is that uh, this is an online only open access journal that allows fast dissemination of high quality, basic translational and clinical research in hepatology. Our goal is to cover bench to bedside, bedside to community and global dissemination type of research. Our goal really is to become a desired publication destination for new discoveries. Uh, to be a resource for hepatologists and all scientists in cutting-edge liver research. We want to serve clinicians with resources for keeping up with advances in basic science and clinical practice and maintain high standard and vigorous peer review uh, for our uh, journal. The authors retain the copyright to their work, which is uh, different from the, um, some of the other publication types. And all articles are immediately available and free to read and share all across the globe. That is, again, a major advantage. I have been uh, really fortunate to work with a fantastic team of associate editors who started this journal and really brought their vision to build the journal over the years. Um, as uh, probably you recognize many of these names, uh, they are um, really leaders in their fields and nicely complement their, their expertise from basic science all the way to clinical practice. The type of papers accepted in hepatology com communications include original articles and this is the majority. Here again, I just want to emphasize that we cover the entire spectrum of basic research, translational research, clinical studies, clinical trials, 
epidemiology and recently healthcare de delivery uh, type of studies. Um, we have editorials and these are typically invi invited by the editors or the associate editors. Review articles are kind of mixed in a way that some of them are invited, but then we also are open to suggestions from the novel uh, review article submission by authors. And I would like to encourage uh, uh, the uh, colleagues from Apostle to think about uh, potential review articles. We are very much interested in that. We take letters to the editor and uh, publish special articles and consensus reports. So our review process is the same as for many journals that, that uh, the articles might be um, early rejected and that's about 28% of articles at this point. And the remaining 72% typically is sent out for peer review, typically two reviewers. Uh, in case of any kind of controversy, we may have a third reviewer or an additional associate editor evaluating the paper. And overall, about 40% of, of those uh, that make it to a review process will have a chance to do a revision. Our overall acceptance, acceptance rate is this about 36% at this point, which obviously is much, much better than hepatology. And we uh, are able to make all of these decisions in a short period of time with an average turnaround of about 28 days. So Dr. Cohen talked about the cascading from hepatology. And indeed, this, this really facilitates the review process. So typically, if a review from hepatology uh, exists for a manuscript and the authors opt to cascade this to our journal to hepatology communication, then very often we won't send out the uh, article for reviews again, but use the reviews of the original article and make a decision and giving, give some suggestions to the edit to the authors how to revise the, the manuscript. If there was no previous review from hepatology, but it was cascaded after an early rejection, then of course we will send out the manuscript for reviews um, through the hepatology communications editorial process. All of this obviously uh, allows a faster turnaround time. And I must say that the likelihood of accept acceptance for those articles that come from hepatology with reviews is much higher than the 36% average acceptance rate. So our first issue um, came to live in February 2017. And as I was looking at the first issue, it made me realize that I need to thank Apostle because one of the most cited papers uh, in this first issue actually was from an Apostle member. Uh, we also developed something new that is the visual abstract feature for uh, hepatology communications. And this visual abstract is essentially a one-pager summary of the article main message. So here I'm showing again a visual abstract of a paper coming that came from uh, Apostle authors from Japan. And uh, these visual abstracts are also tweeted out. So we are trying to engage social media and make this uh, new um, information in available to authors immediately. So I think the most exciting news about hepatology communications is that just about uh, a few days ago, we learned that the journal has been accepted to the Science Citation Index Expanded, which means that we will have an impact factor next summer in the summer of 2021. This is obviously a very exciting point and we hope that this will really boost the number of submissions to our journal and increase your confidence in our journal. So some of the new initiatives that Hepatology started are the special collections. We recently released the COVID-19 issue and the healthcare delivery and public health issue that was collated by our first Hepatology Editorial Fellow. This is a new opportunity for trainees to learn about the editorial process. And uh, going forward, we have some high level articles that uh, are invited for review articles based on the 2020 ASLD meeting. So just to close, Stay connected, follow us on the Twitter, and download the new uh, ESLD multi-app multi uh, for the journals, and uh, continue to work with us, and we look forward to receiving your um, articles. So thank you. I'm going to stop about hepatologic communications at this point, and it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Robert Brown, 
who is the Gladys and uh, Ronald Harriman Professor of Medicine, uh, Clinical Chief of the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, and Vice Chair of the Mentorship and Academic Development at Vail Cornell Medical College in New York City. He received his uh, EB from Harvard College, his medical degree from New York University, with an M MPH from the University of California. Um, he did his residency at the Bethesda Deaconess uh, Hospital at Harvard Medical School and the Fellowship in Gastroenterology and Hepatology at UCSF. He has co-authored over 200 peer-reviewed articles and is the new Editor-in-Chief of Liver Transplantation. So, Dr. Brand. Thank you very much and I want to thank uh, the members of APOSL for uh, inviting me to uh, talk a little bit about uh, liver transplantation, which I was uh, grateful to become the sixth editor-in-chief of the journal that I submitted my first uh, paper to when I was a fellow at UCSF. Um, liver transplantation, formerly liver transplantation and surgery, has expanded its scope as the field of liver transplantation has expanded from a purely surgical field to an intensely collaborative field uh, dedicated to keeping patients with liver failure and liver cancer alive through medical and surgical techniques. And our vision is to be the journal for liver failure, the advanced forms of liver disease and its management by publishing the highest impact that we can, clinical, basic, and translational science in liver failure, as well as liver cancer, liver surgery, including liver replacement, which is the state of the art. This will hopefully enhance our craft of managing patients with liver failure and promote global collaboration around the care of these patients, where the advances in different parts of our countries um, really varies from Asia where living donor liver transplantation has really been at the forefront to the United States where advances in deceased donor transplantation have been at the forefront. Um, the scope of our journal has changed as our practice has changed. So we now uh, publish almost half of our papers on chronic liver disease, really focused on advanced liver disease, liver failure, uh, liver cancer, um, as well as um, advances in liver transplantation, normothermic uh, liver perfusion, liver surgery, so that we can stay abreast of this really rapidly evolving uh, specialty. We also want to deliver the best experience, both to our readers and our authors. For our readers, you know, many transplant journals go across all forms of transplant, yet most of us concentrate all of our effort on liver disease and liver transplant. I, I want to be able to have a journal that I want to read cover to cover. And we want to have our authors have a wonderful experience, meaning streamlined editorial process, knowing right away whether your paper's in or out, and then for, for accepted work to really promote it so that you get, particularly for our young um, uh, authors, the best experience. So in collaboration with Wiley's author services, a misspelling there. They also do editing, um, obviously not of my slides, and a growing social media and internet presence, where here we have Elliot Tapper, who is the former king of, of liver Twitter. Our new social media editors are gonna overtake him. So come check us out at LTX Journal and follow the hashtag uh, liver Twitter, and we will make sure your work gets out there. We, um, to reflect this, we actually changed the entire um, cover and table of contents. You'll see our first issue. We've been hard at work for the last six months, the deputy and associate editors, but these are our new table of contents, which is really organized along the clinical pathway of patients with advanced liver disease. So we have sections on liver failure and portal hypertension, wait list outcomes and organ allocation, liver surgery and organ preservation, hepatobiliary malignancies and transplant oncology, and peri and post-transplant management, including long-term outcomes. And both clinical, immunologic, adult, and pediatric papers 
fit into those five categories which you get to identify when you submit. We also streamlined the type of papers we were accepting. Um, a lot of them, a lot of the sections seemed vague. So now it's original research. And then what used to be called letters to the front line, which I never really understood what they were, is now rapid communications and brief reports. Um, we welcome letters to the editor. And like David um, uh, and uh, John G, we accept reviews and editorials. If you wish to submit a review, um, send me an email um, with a brief description of where it fits, and we will let you know whether it is clearly invited, ready for peer, acceptable for peer review, or we don't think it's the right fit. Um, we're right in the middle between hepatology and hepcom uh, with an acceptance rate of about 20%. Um, we uh, early reject fewer papers rec reflecting that many of our papers need to at least get um, out to reviewers who are expertise in the um, review process. But if it's not going to get in, we want to let you know really quickly. Um, the early rejects come back within a week, usually within two or three days. And once again, like hepatology, if we think this would fit in our open access journal, we'll let you know. Of the manuscripts that are sent out for peer review, um, we will have two reviewers. We do offer at no cost English editing as needed and provide statistical review. If you get a reject and resubmit and you do everything that is asked of you, the likelihood is it will be accepted after that one major revision. Nothing more frustrating than um, getting a reject with hope um, hoping, working, and then getting more comments and, uh, and an ultimate rejection. So if you get to that point and you're able to do it, you can feel reasonably confident that you're, you will see it in press. Um, they come out almost immediately online and then in a subsequent issue. And once again, we do send uh, papers with reviews to HEPCOM. Um, I couldn't make that fancy map. I'm sure my social media editors could, but I didn't give them enough time. But once again, we uh, selected a broad array from the United States, from uh, Europe, and from Australasia for our editorial board. Our editorial board is only half full. So if you um, do a great job reviewing or send us a bunch of fantastic manuscripts, we, we're still looking for some uh, excellent members of our editorial board, and we'd love to have some Apostle members uh, fill out that group. I'm really looking forward to today's uh, presentations. Um, greetings from New York. I wish we were all together, and I hope that 2021 uh, that will happen. Okay. Thanks so much, Dr. Brown, Dr. Zabo. Um, I'm just staring, I just want to, uh, while I introduce the first speaker, I just want you to know we're gonna have, remind you, we're gonna have a panel at the end. Your questions are welcome about the content, about the journals. Please type your questions into the chat or question and answer boxes and we'll discuss them. Um, so it's my, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, the first speaker. Um, the topic is going to be non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, highlights in the journal, our journals for the last two years. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Professor Sonal Kumar as our speaker. She is an assistant professor of medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College. She is the director of clinical hepatology and the founder and director of iChange, which is a highly innovative multidisciplinary clinic for the treatment of gastrointestinal diseases related to obesity. Dr. Kumar's clinical research, clinical and research interests are in the diagnosis and management of patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Professor Kumar. Hello everyone. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Cohen. Um, and I'd like to thank the org organizers from APASL and ASLD for inviting me to speak today about some of the important articles in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that have been published over the last two years across the ASLD journals. So let's get started. 
The first paper I'm going to highlight is the unexpected rapid increase in the burden of NAFLD in China from 2008 to 2018, a systematic review and meta-analysis. This was published last year. So everyone's aware that the prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease has been rising for quite some time in Western countries. But NAFLD is no longer a disease of only Western nations, and it's really important that we understand that this is a global problem and we really need increased awareness across the world. So the aim of this study was to provide an overview of the status of NAFLD in China over the last decade. It was a systematic review and meta-analysis there were 392 studies with a total of over 2 million participants. The authors did a lot of analysis within the study. They did a really good job, but I tried to pick out some of the highlights. The big things, one, there was a rise in prevalence from 25.4% in 2008 to 2010 to 32.3% in 2015 to 2018. Although this may not seem like a dramatic absolute increase, but this is twice the rate of growth in Western countries. And then specifically looking at patients with chronic hepatitis B as well, uh, the prevalence of also having NAFLD increased from 8.1% to 31.8%. Highest rates were seen in people aged 50 to 59 and males over females, but interestingly, the annual incidence is higher, was higher in those under the age of 45. As expected, the major risk factor was obesity, um, interestingly, there was a U-shaped association with GDP, and then there were some regional differences with higher rates in Northwest mainland China and Taiwan. So the conclusions of this paper were that the national prevalence of NAFLD in China is growing rapidly and is increasing higher than some Western nations and has surpassed actually the global prevalence. With the increased incidence seen in the younger population that age under 45, there is a also a concern for heavier disease burden in the, in the near future, even higher than what we're seeing right now. And then progression of NAFLD in Chinese patients may be different from what we see in Western countries. There are differences like genetics, dietary factors, and then comorbidities like hepatitis B. And specifically, the coexistence of hep B and NAFLD is concerning for potential faster disease progression and more complications such as HCC. So the next paper from hepatology is non-invasive tests accurately identify advanced fibrosis due to NASH. Baseline data from the Stellar trials. With the rising prevalence of NAFLD across the world, we want to be able to select out the patients that are at high at risk, highest risk for complications. We can't possibly treat everyone with NAFLD. And so we want to pick out those with advanced fibrosis. There's a huge focus, therefore, on using non-invasive testing to select out this patient population, but it only will work if the non-invasive tests are accurate. So there are a lot of studies that have looked at non-invasive tests, but the aim of this specific study was to use composite scores and or transient elastography to detect advanced fibrosis. The study used data from the Stellar trial, trials, which were two phase three trials of silencertib, a drug that unfortunately wasn't shown to have a benefit in NAFLD. But the study included both liver biopsies and non-invasive testing, so it provided good data to look for correlation between the two. The original Stellar trials uh, were a global study that included, uh, that enrolled from 26 different countries across the world. Patients had either stage three fibrosis or compensated cirrhosis per liver biopsy to be enrolled. And so what the authors did was assess the use of composite scores using that baseline data from the Stellar trials. And they looked at the FIB4 score, NAFLD fibrosis score, and ELF score. And then in the subgroup, they also looked at liver stiffness with transient elastography to see if those tests were accurate in detecting advanced fibrosis. And they looked at various ways of doing this. So they looked at single tests or looked at two or three tests. And then with the two tests, they looked at looking at two tests simultaneously or sequentially. So here are the results. Screening data um, for th over 3,000 patients were used. The median time between biopsy and non-invasive testing was 34 days. And then you can see in the table on the left that most patients were either F3 or F4, which makes sense because that was the patient population that the stellar trials were looking for. But they were, they were the patients that we want to pick out, those with advanced fibrosis. With a single test, there was no threshold that could balance sensitivity and specificity. So that wasn't a good, good option with just using a threshold. 
And then if you used upper and lower limits, there were just too many indeterminate results. And that was with a single test. When looking at two tests simultaneously, they, were, they had the same problem as the upper and lower limits with one test. There were too, much, too many indeterminate results, up to 77%. But what the authors found is that when you looked at two sequential non-invasive tests, and specifically the one that performed the best was looking at the FIB4 score followed by transient elastography. You can see here on the right, both the indeterminate results and list classifications went down to 20%. There were 11% false positives. So 11% of patients were diagnosed with advanced fibrosis, but didn't actually have it when looking at the liver biopsy. And then 20% false negatives. So it had advanced fibrosis by biopsy, but that wasn't picked up by the non-invasive tests. So the conclusions of this, this study were that there was, there was still some inaccuracy. The, the non-invasive tests are not perfect, um, but commonly avail, available non-invasive tests do perform relatively well when used sequentially to detect advanced fibrosis. This is one of the larger studies looking at the use of non-invasive testing and potentially offers a practical approach to selecting out those that are at high, highest risk at complica of complications. So this can be used with primary care offices where they can do preliminary non-invasive testing and then refer to specialists if needed for further for that second line. So next up is non-heavy drinking and worsening of non-invasive markers in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, a cohort study. So whether patients with NAFLD can be allowed non-heavy alcohol consumption is still controversial. There have been a lot of prior studies and they have really varied in their conclusions, but the problem with most of them is that they have been cross-sectional, so just one point in time. So these authors tried to rectify that. They, the aim of their study was to assess the risk of non-heavy drinking on disease progression in NAFLD. So this was a longitudinal study of low-risk NAFLD patients in Korea. There are over 58,000 patients. They selected patients by uh, seeing if they had fatty liver on ultrasound and then some sort of follow-up. Patients were excluded if they have other, had other identifiable, identifiable causes of steatosis like medications, heavy alcohol use. They uh, excluded everyone with cirrhosis or intermediate slash high fibrosis scores by those non-invasive tests because they really wanted to look at disease pro progression. So they wanted to select out the patients that were at, had low levels of fibrosis and see if they would progress over time. Patients were categorized, uh, male versus females were different, um, but they were categorized to either non-drinking, light drinking, or moderate drinking. And then the non-invasive tests that were their primary endpoint were the FIB4 score, NAFLD fibrosis score, and then the APRI. So here are the results. As you can see, no matter which non-invasive test was used, the age and sex adjusted hazard ratio was significantly increased in light and moderate drinkers compared to non-drinkers. But the argument could be made that there are other factors that are playing a role here. So the authors performed two multivariable models. The first one con controlled for age, sex, BMI, and then other things like history of hypertension, medications for hypertension, medications for diabetes, diabetes, and medications for dyslipidemia. And then the second model was the same as the first one, but it added CRP and HOMA-RR. And then again, there was still a significant risk with moderate alcohol use. So the conclusions of this study were that moderate alcohol consumption is associated with increased risk of fibrosis progression, even when controlling for other common risk factors of disease progression. Patients are at risk for progressing from low or to intermediate or high fibrosis scores per non-invasive testing. So it's something to consider when we talk to patients about alcohol use in fatty liver disease. So moving on to some studies on liver transplant and fatty liver disease. This is a recent publication in liver transplantation. Outcomes of liver transplantation among older recipients with NASH in a large multi-center U.S. cohort, re-evaluating age limits in a transplantation consortium. 
One of the realities of the increasing prevalence of obesity and diabetes and NAFLD is that the, the liver transplant population is also aging. And we know that NASH and older age are both associated with in, increased cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome and metabolic comorbidities, which may increase adverse outcomes after liver transplant. And so the aim of this study was to characterize those outcomes, characterize outcomes of older liver transplant recipients from NASH and compare to them to non-NASH recipients. So this study looked at patients who were old, age 65 or older um, from 2010 to 2016 at 13 different centers. There were 1,023 patients that were included and the mean follow-up was 1,254 days. At baseline, you can see that patients had more coronary artery disease, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, which was all expected. And then the concern, obviously, is that because of these comorbidities, there may be an increased risk of complications after transplant. So the primary outcome was in this study was time to graft failure. Secondary outcomes included time to death, and then clinically significant events within the first year after transplant, like cardiovascular events, malignancy, infection, et cetera. And then as you can see in the graph, there is no difference between one or three year graft survival, which is really reassuring. Um, and then no significant difference in risk of complications, including liver specific complications, such as rejection and stricture or thrombosis. But also the things that we thought may have uh, may t turn out to be higher in the NASH patients wasn't. So cardiovascular, neuro neurologic, infectious, and malignant complications were no different between the NASH and the non-NASH patients. The only difference that the authors found was that there were the NASH patients did have longer post-transplant intubated days, days in the ICU, and total length of stay. So what this means is that liver transplant recipients with NASH do not necessarily have higher risk of most complications post-transplant. And NASH should not deter liver transpl transplant in older age groups despite the higher baseline comorbidities. So the next paper um, is about fatty liver treatment. The ASLD journals really have been on the forefront of publishing data on the treatment of NAFLD, whether it be drugs that are already FDA approved for other conditions or drugs that are in development. So I'll highlight one of those papers. This is liraglutide citagliptin and insulin glargine added to metformin, the effect on body weight and intrahepatic lipid in patients with type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease. So we know that diabetes is associated with increased risk of NASH and fibrosis. And metformin is the first line of treatment for diabetes, but unfortunately has not panned out in terms of having a histologic benefit in NAFLD. And then on top of that, there's no convincing data on the use of other diabetes drugs such as labraglutide, citagliptin, or insulin alone in NAFLD. So the aim of this study was to evaluate the use of add-on therapy to, for diabetes um, and see the effect on fatty liver. This was a 26-week comparative trial of combination therapy, looking at intrahepatic lipid content, abdominal obesity, adiposity, and glycemic control. Patients were included if they had MRI PDFF greater than 10%, inadequate control of diabetes, so an A1C of 6.5 to 10%, BMI 20 to 35, they had to be on a stable dose of baseline metformin therapy, and then they were randomized one to one to one to receive the treatment, and they had standard of care dosing of that. So here are the results. The authors saw that liraglutide and citagliptin both improved intrahepatic lipid content. You can see in the chart on the left, there's a significant reduction in weight with the liraglutide group compared to the insulin group. They didn't, really, they didn't have a control group, so everything was really compared to the in, insulin group. And change in MRI PDFF in both, there was a change in MRI PDFF in both the liraglutide and the citagliptin group compared to the insulin group. And this held true even when adjusting for change in weight. So we, not all of it is, a, uh, is attributed to change in weight. And then liraglutide was also shown to have an impact on adipose tissue, both subcutaneous and visceral compared to the other groups. So the conclusions of this trial were that combined with metformin, the three second-line anti-diabetic agents that were studied were able to improve glycemic control. And then in combination with metformin, both liraglutide and citagliptin could improve intrahepatic lipid even when controlling change for change in weight. So these find, findings are, are useful because they help, may help guide ph pharmacotherapy in patients with both diabetes and fatty liver disease.
we've talked a lot about MRI, PDFF, and non-invasive testing. So the next paper that I'm going to quickly go over is the multi-center validation of association between decline in MRI PDFF and histologic response in MNASH. So there are a lot of studies, like I said, there are a lot of studies that, are, that assess the efficacy of drugs, especially in the early phase trials, by using MRI PDFF instead of doing a liver biopsy. And a few single center studies have shown that 30, a 30% 30 relative reduction in MRI PDFF is, may correlate with histologic response in NASH. So the aim of this trial was to actually do the same thing, but do this in the multi-center trial. It was to evaluate the association between decline in MRI PDFF and liver biopsy. This was a secondary analysis of the Flint trial. So the Flint trial was the original trial that evaluated obeta-colic acid for fatty liver disease. Of those patients within the trial, there were 70, 78 patients who had both paired MRIs and liver biopsies. The authors uh, define histologic response as a two-point improvement in NAFLD activity score and no worsening of fibrosis. And you can see that the greater the, greater the reduction in MRI PDFF, the greater the odds of improvement in NAFLD activity score. And then what they found in sensitivity analysis is that the optimal cutoff point is a relative decrease in PDFF of 29.8% which correlates with the histology improvement. And that just goes along with all of the other single center studies that have um, shown that 30% is the cutoff that we should use. They also divided everyone into greater than 30% reduction or less than 30% reduction. And the proportion who had a two-point improvement in NAFLD activity score without worsening of fibrosis was 50% if there was a greater than 30% reduction and 19% if there wasn't. And this was also statistically significant. So this was a multi-center trial that provided validation data regarding the association between histologic response and a 30% decline in MRI PDFF relative to baseline. This really helped validate that it is appropriate or it is acceptable to use that 30% cutoff when looking at treatment response criteria, right now for trials, but maybe also in the future when medications are approved. And then the last paper I'm gonna talk about is, today is donor fecal microbiota transplantation alters gut microbiota and metabolites in obese individuals with steatohepatitis. We've talked a lot about drugs, but nothing has really been FDA, has been approved or shown to be convincingly, uh, or can, has worked well in fatty liver disease. So people are starting to think outside the box and think about potentially FMT. So we know that alterations in gut microbiome are seen in fatty liver disease. And animal studies have suggested that FMT may alter steatohepatitis. And then furthermore, we know that plant-based low animal diets or vegan diets are associated with a reduced NAFLD incidence. But FMT really hasn't been studied well in humans yet. So this study started to do that. The aim was to evaluate three eight-weekly lean vegan donor FMT versus autologous FMT on the severity of NAFLD using liver biopsies to see the effect. This was a single-center, double-blind, randomized control trial. Donors had to be lean and on a vegan diet. Recipients had a BMI greater than 25 and steatosis on ultrasound, and then they were excluded if other causes of, there were other causes of steatosis or had potential sources of altered gut microbiota, like they were on antibiotics or PPIs. And here are the results. There was a trend towards significant improvement in necroinflammatory scores. So that was, that was really interesting. There was a potential histologic response um, with FMT, but the study unfortunately was not powered to show a statistically significant improvement. And then the authors also found that a change in gut microbiota composition and plasma metabolites with regards to amino acids were found in the, uh, the patients that got the vegan donor FMT. So the conclusions of this trial were that the allogenic donor FMT in individuals with fatty liver affect hepatic gene expression and plasma metabolites that are commonly involved in inflammation and lipid metabolism. And this really provides pilot data and sample size calculations for further studies regarding FMT. And I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kumar. Let me re just remind you, to, uh, you can type your, your questions into the chat or Q&A boxes.
Uh, and now I'd like to introduce the next speaker. Uh, the topic is hepatitis B. We have an expert in this area, Professor Mindy Nguyen, who is Professor of Medicine and by courtesy Professor of Epidemiology and Public Health, Director of the Hepatology Fellowship, Director of the Hepatology Clerkship, and member, a member of the Appointment and Promotions Committee and a Diversity Advisor for the Department of Medicine at Stanford University Medical Center. She's an active clinician and researcher in viral hepatitis, NAFLD, and liver cancer with over 200 original research publications, including first or senior authorship in the New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet Gastroenterology and Hepatology, Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and the Journal of Hepatology, um, as well as JAMA. She served on uh, editorial advisory board member for major journals such as Lancet Gastroenterology and Hepatology, Gastroenterology, and our journal Hepatology. She has served as chair of the Hepatitis B SIG for the AASLD. She has mentored over 130 trainees uh, in, uh, in her research program, and these now populate the ranks of academic institutions throughout. Professor Nguyen. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, David, uh, uh, and I also would like to thank the organizers of this uh, meeting for giving me a chance to uh, review the highlights of the Hepatitis B publication in Hepatology Journal this past year. So, um, Reflecting back on um, what um, had been published by Hepatology this past year, uh, I cannot help but uh, thinking about this in the framework of HBV elimination. So I think we all have heard a lot about the 2030 WHO uh, HBV viral hepatitis uh, in general elim elimination goals. So uh, this is a very big goal and in order to um, uh, accomplish this, we have to think about this and uh, approach this in many different directions. So first is diagnosis and linkage to care. And second is uh, what are the hepatitis B population that we have uh, today? And um, then what do we do with the current treatment? And the main thing about this, I believe, is HCC prevention, because uh, we have had oral antiviral therapy for hepatitis B for about two decades now. So fortunately, we don't have as many Hep B patients coming in for acute liver failure or acute on chronic, but mainly for HCC and uh, complications related to that. So it's a big topic. And then novel biomarkers, both for disease monitoring as well as diagnostics. And uh, last but not least, the novel HBV cure therapies. So I hope in the next uh, 15, uh, uh, 17 minutes to review with you uh, some of the seminal observations uh, that have been published in hepatology. But more than that, I hope to um, encourage uh, future research and how these works help uh, define and lead uh, future directions for research and public health, uh, and uh, as well as clinical practice and translational work. Um, so I would like to start this with uh, work from the U.S. data, but with a very strong link to uh, the CHB populations outside of the U.S. and a lot of these are from the Asia Pacific area. So um, this is data from our population base uh, and Hay survey in the U.S. And uh, it shows us something that is encouraging and something that is not so encouraging and help uh, forge uh, what we need to do next. So you could uh, take a look at the solid blue line here. So this is uh, vaccine induced immunity uh, in US born population. So this is uh, improving and it has improved in the past decade here. So that is encouraging. And we saw the same trend, even though the absolute uh, uh, um, prevalence is a little bit lower in our foreign-born population here. But what is not so encouraging is to look at the prevalence of hepatitis B uh, infection in the U.S. It stay about the same uh, between 1999 and 2016. So despite of whatever um, uh, medical and public health uh, efforts in the past decade, 
uh, we didn't seem to really move much uh, in terms of prevalence. We didn't decrease it. And a lot of this also because we have a large immigrant population from overseas and more than half of our happy population in the U.S. are what we call imported or foreign born. And a large uh, majority of this foreign born happy population in the U.S. are from the Asia Pacific area. In fact, 90% uh, of my hepatitis B patients at Stanford and uh, in the Bay Area here are Asian uh, Americans. Um, this uh, work here uh, is from the group in Toronto, uh, but uh, in Toronto, the hepatitis B population are um, not so different uh, from our populations in the Bay Area as well in that the majority also seem to be foreign born and a lot, uh, a lot of them are from the Asia Pacific areas. So uh, what this study uh, showed that I thought are very important and sobering and something to remember. Um, and hopefully uh, something we can do something about uh, in the near future. So you could see here the black line. So black is usually bad. So I, I like it that the author represents uh, uh, the bad uh, uh, outcome here in black. So the black uh, uh, solid bars here are the prevalence of the hepatitis C within six months from complications of liver failure, HCC or liver transplant. And in fact, you could see for over this whole period of time, from 2003 to 2014 here, um, the people who were diagnosed within six months from complications were much higher than the people who were diagnosed more than six months. And we are not even talking about two years or five years here, so a very short time. So this uh, is quite sobering, I thought, um, and that it shows that the, a lot of the patients are diagnosed too late. Uh, so the antiviral therapy that we have currently, even though they are not perfect, uh, they have been shown to uh, prevent and decrease the risk of cancer and mortality. But for most of these patients, uh, it's too late uh, for that. So this is uh, something that uh, should um, uh, be rectified. Um, and uh, how about looking at the um, progress in this in even a big, uh, more global term? So, um, I mean, global at the national level. So this is the data from Australia. So um, I think we all know that Australia, um, it has been doing quite well with HCV elimination. So this is for HBV. So according to this modeling study, Australia would meet their national goal of 80% diagnosed in, uh, by 2030. And I thought that's very impressive, uh, even though uh, that is still lower than the HO 100% diagnosed. But, uh, and, you know, most things in life are difficult to be 100%. So uh, I think this is very impressive. And Australia started out in 2000, which is 20 years ago, with almost 50% of their Hep B patients already diagnosed. Uh, and that is quite impressive. Uh, uh, looking at the US data, uh, which I'm not uh, really showing here, uh, to give a frame of reference. So as of uh, data by 2016, the US uh, Hep B diagnosis rate is only about 20%. So uh, the U.S. is uh, far behind, uh, and if I don't know what the modeling will show, uh, how we would do by 2030. And I think that many areas of the world would not um, um, uh, have the um, uh, fortune of having uh, this uh, data as Australia, but that's the goal that uh, we should all aim at. And then uh, what do we do with the 290 million hepatitis B? Uh, that we already have um, um, that, and we know that 90% have not been diagnosed. Uh, so another thing to also keep in mind is that the Hep B population has been aging, and uh, hepatology have published um, a few papers. Uh, started out with U.S. data, nationwide data, and then uh, the territory-wide data from Hong Kong. And uh, after this, there have been additional publications from different areas of the world in other uh, journals um, that uh, have uh, described and observed uh, similar things. And this is very pertinent because the population are uh, aging. Uh, 
and with more comorbidities and more metabolic diseases. And as we saw in the last uh, presentation, NAFOD is not a problem of the West anymore. Uh, the prevalence in Asia now is about 30% on average. Uh, so it's a very pertinent uh, uh, topic that has both practice implication as well as public health um, uh, implication. Um, uh, as a corollary to that, uh, another important publication in hepatology uh, this past year is about the association between metabolic disease and HCC. So um, we, uh, the previous uh, publications have generally shown that diabetes is associated with HCC, and this has been known and shown for Hep C very well uh, for uh, decades now. Uh, more recently, uh, uh, diabetes has also been shown to associate with HCC risk for Hep B patients. But this study um, uh, from Korea uh, went one step further in that the components of metabolic uh, risk factors uh, are additive. So this, uh, gr these graphs seem to be similar to what we saw with the review data that we saw about 20 years ago with the increasing incremental increase in the HBV DNA levels uh, associated with incremental increase uh, risk in HCC. Uh, so uh, this is a very uh, important observation. And this observation should also lead us to look at future studies on um, would optimizing the management or control of these risk factors, would that also decrease HCC risk like what we have been able to show subsequently to the review data associated with decrease in HCC risk. So um, I hope this also will um, uh, stimulate further research uh, to follow up on this observation. And um, um, uh, talking about metabolic diseases and NAFOD, um, we cannot uh, not talk about uh, the outcome of patients who have both Hep B and uh, NAFOD. So the global prevalence, according to an older estimate uh, published uh, also in hepatology in 2016, the global prevalence was about 25%. Um, I suspect that updated prevalence would be significantly higher than that. And uh, the Asia prevalence uh, in a more updated uh, meta-analysis is about 29%. So um, in most of the uh, APASO uh, countries uh, in the Western Pacific, uh, the prevalence would be around 30% too. So this is very pertinent. So in this study, the authors uh, found that NASH, um, and NASH with advanced fibrosis in particular uh, in Hep B patient is associated with increase in mortality. So another thing to emphasize here is that we're not talking about the regular NAFOD, but these are uh, biopsy proven NASH case. So a fairly selected population of patients. Um, and even among this selected population, NASH by itself is not associated with increase in uh, worse outcomes, but NASH with advanced fibrosis, similar to what we see in NAFOD. Uh, so I think that this is a uh, very important uh, observation. Um, related to this, again, metabolic is the statin use in HCC. So I think that aspirin and statin uh, use associated with decreased cancer risk were originally, at least in our field, uh, shown for colon cancer. And then more and more with statin use with uh, liver disease. Uh, and this one specifically for chronic hepatitis B and uh, the authors uh, did a nice work in showing uh, that uh, there is a time-dependent as well as dose-dependent response. So this is always tricky, you know, for observational study to show a uh, treatment effect. Um, so uh, to mitigate this, you know, dose-dependent uh, and time-dependent help uh, clarify some of this. But again, you know, it is still an observational data and uh, future studies of uh, intervention design uh, help uh, look into this uh, process uh, further. And uh, this also kind of correlate with the other uh, papers that I showed earlier uh, in that uh, if we have incremental increase uh, in HCC risk with metabolic risk factors, would controlling these metabolic risks um, also translate into decreased risk? Uh, that is something uh, that uh, should be defined and investigated. <clears throat> 
um, then we cannot talk about ACC prevention uh, in chronic hepatitis B without talking about this topic uh, that uh, has seen a lot of studies, uh, both original research uh, uh, studies as well as systematic review uh, studies. Um, so uh, hepatology uh, journal um, uh, also published an important paper on this uh, topic uh, recently. And um, in, this, uh, uh, to, uh, in, in this study and in uh, the aggregate efforts uh, 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 presented uh, in the hepatology as well as many other journals, uh, is that uh, after controlling for especially uh, and patient based life characteristics, uh, it seems that uh, tenofovir and, and, and tecovir are equally effective in ACC prevention. And I believe that is a very important uh, fact, uh, uh, in, important observation, because um, Hep B affects many people in developing areas where resources are uh, lim limited. So cost is an important issue. So I think that uh, both of these drugs being equally effective is useful so that the treatment decision should just be based on uh, the risk profile for the specific patient as well as uh, cost of these drugs in uh, the areas uh, of the patients. And then moving on to uh, novel biomarkers. So I would like to show a few examples of this. Uh, so this is an example on uh, novel biomarkers being developed uh, to um, diagnose or monitor HCC treatment in a patient with HBV-related HCC. So this will show a correlation between these novel biomarkers and the tumor burden, both in terms of size as well as of fetoprotein or PIFCA levels. Uh, this is another example of a novel biomarkers, uh, HBV RNA profiles, and uh, this show very nicely the correlation between HBV RNA and the patient with hepatitis B in different phases, uh, from E positive chronic infection uh, to um, E negative, and to people who have zero clear uh, their uh, surface antigen. So uh, it uh, could be a useful markers uh, in uh, therapy monitoring, and especially with the HBV clear. Um, therapies in the near future. And there are too many uh, studies um, on the therapeutic care arena, so I just want to list a few here. Uh, examples uh, how uh, hepatology have contributed uh, uh, to the field by uh, reporting uh, these important studies, both in clinical trial like the ARC520, early clinical trial uh, data, as well as even preclinical uh, data here. Uh, that um, um, I listed here, but these are uh, um, uh, only a few examples that I could cover for hepatitis B uh, in these 15-18 uh, uh, minutes, uh, but I hope that it uh, uh, provides us with a, a, a good overview of uh, the work that uh, had been uh, contributed by hepatology. So, uh, in summary, uh, we have 290 million people not yet diagnosed so much work are needed uh, on screening and di diagnosis, obviously, and we need to prevent HCC with current therapies. This is what we have, and we have 290 million already infected, uh, but uh, we definitely uh, need a better point of care diagnostics as well as treatment monitoring biomarkers, and uh, definitely we need a cure. And having a cure, a finite therapy that is well tolerated, I suspect that should really help with the diagnosis uh, and linkage to care effort. Uh, with that, I would like to thank um, uh, everyone for your attention. Professor Nguyen, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, so we'll move on from here, uh, from non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis to alcoholic liver disease. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. John Rice, who is an associate professor of medicine and the section chief of hepatology in the division of gastroenterology and hepatology at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Dr. Rice completed his medical degree at the University of Nebraska College of Medicine. He completed his internal medicine training and served as chief resident at McGraw Medical Center of Northwestern University in Chicago 
then he completed gastroenterology and hepatology and transplant hepatology fellowships in the University of Wisconsin hospitals and clinics. He currently serves as staff transplant hepatologist at the University of uh, Wisconsin in Madison. In Madison. In addition to his clinical duties, Dr. Rice serves as the medical director of the Live Donor Liver Transplant Program. He also served as co-medical director of the uh, University of Wisconsin Health Liver and Pancreas Center, and he will be soon assuming the role of medical director of liver transplantation. Dr. Rice's clinical and, uh, and the clinical research interests include the management of alcohol-associated liver disease, alcohol use disorder, and liver transplant selection outcomes in alcoholic liver disease. He's a member of the American Consortium of the Early Liver Transplantation in Alcoholic Hepatitis, the Accelerate Age Study Group, and uh, serves as the chair of the Global Outreach Committee in the ASLD in the Alcoholic Liver Disease Special Interest, Interest Group. So Dr. Rice, we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. All right, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers from Apostle and the ASLD for the opportunity to speak at this special session. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, highlighting some publications uh, in alcohol-associated liver disease from the three journals of the ASLD. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So I'm going to start with a, a paper from hepatology uh, in an uh, exciting and provocative area of uh, the uh, microbiome uh, related to alcohol-associated hepatitis. Uh, the title of this manuscript is The Fecal Microbiome Distinguishes uh, alcohol, uh, alcohol, Alcoholic Hepatitis But Does Not Discriminate Disease Severity. Uh, just to best some background information, as we all know, alcohol-associated hepatitis is a severe manifestation of alcohol-associated liver disease. However, only a minority of people that consume alcohol in a harmful manner develop it. Uh, we know there are quantitative and qualitative changes in the intestinal microbiome uh, that are linked with the development of ALD. However, it's unclear if these microbiome changes in ALD are related to alcohol consumption itself or if there are distinct changes uh, associated with alcoholic hepatitis. So just uh, uh, the schematic here to remind us that the host gut microbiome is uh, impacted by a number of factors, uh, including early life colonization, age, diet, uh, both psychological and metabolic stress, and the underlying host immune system. Uh, under healthy circumstances, there's homeostasis between the microbiome and the host. However, states of dysbiosis can lead to disease and inflammation. So the purpose of this study was to determine the microbial ecology in alcohol-associated hepatitis and if this signature was unique from alcohol consumption itself. Uh, they related the microbial changes to disease severity in alcoholic hepatitis. So could they determine who uh, had severe versus mild to moderate? And then to infer the functional relevance of these changes uh, with disease severity. So this study came out of the TREAT Consortium, which is a multi-center study uh, a prospective uh, of alcoholic hepatitis, uh, and they enrolled uh, patients who met NIAAA criteria for a clinical diagnosis of alcohol-associated hepatitis. Uh, for severity definition, they used a MELD cutoff of 20 to, to uh, distinguish mild to moderate alcohol-associated hepatitis from those with severe disease, uh, and uh, they excluded patients on lactulose and rifaximin uh, due to the uh, impact of those medications on the microbiome. Uh, study subjects were compared uh, to heavy drinking controls without evidence of liver disease uh, and then normal controls without excess alcohol consumption. Uh, I won't get into the, the extensive detail about how they an analyzed the stool, but for the microbiome analysis, they uh, identified uh, the microbiome using 16S rRNA uh, and then length heterogeneity PCR fingerprinting uh, to amplify the samples. Uh, and then multi-sag sequencing was used to interrogate the microbial taxa. Uh, they also uh, analyzed the stool for short-chain fatty acid concentration. Um, and the uh, reason behind that is the uh, importance of short-chain fatty acids in maintaining gut luminal integrity and the mediation of the inflammatory response. Uh, here's the study cohort. Um, there was no difference uh, in the control groups uh, and um, alcohol-associated hepatitis uh, cohorts 
in terms of age or gender. Uh, there were laboratory abnormalities, which one might expect for alcohol-associated hepatitis. Uh, important to note that um, more patients in the heavy drinking controls and alcohol-associated hepatitis cohorts were on acid-reducing medications, which can have uh, an impact on the microbiome. So in terms of results, uh, the first uh, thing of note was that in heavy drinking controls compared to healthy controls, there was an increase in the Firmicute to bacteroidetes ratio. Uh, this ratio was uh, also seen in alcohol-associated hepatitis, although albeit to a lower degree. Uh, at a phyla level, one uh, interesting finding was the proportion of proteobacteria increased significantly in patients with severe alcohol-associated hepatitis. Um, at a uh, genus level, there was a decrease uh, in alpha diversity uh, in alcohol-associated hepatitis, and this is uh, represented in the uh, Shannon alpha diversity plot in the top left here. Uh, as you can see, as you move from left, which is the he healthy controls, to the right, which is alcohol-associated hepatitis, you see a decrease in alpha diversity, uh, particularly in severe alcohol-associated hepatitis. In terms of global bacterial composition, this was significantly different across the four, four cohorts. Uh, and this is represented in the principal coordinate analysis on the bottom left here. So there was a difference in global composition across the four, co four co cohorts, although uh, there were several outliers. And what I mean by that is uh, there were healthy controls that had a similar bacterial composition uh, to those with alcohol-associated hepatitis and vice versa. The authors then attempted to uh, model uh, alcoholic hepatitis based on the uh, microbiome. What you see here in the top left uh, are the top 20 tax that they included in their model uh, that predicted alcohol-associated hepatitis. And as you can see here and the receiver operating characteristic, the model performed reasonably well with an area under the curve of 0.826. Uh, in this model, the, uh, the uh, uh, genus moves uh, left to right in terms of order of importance. So the ones on the left were more important in the model uh, and moving to the right. Uh, they attempted to also model patients with severe alcohol-associated hepatitis uh, with, again, the same uh, schematic down here at the bottom left with importance going from left to right. However, that model did not uh, discriminate disease severity uh, with any degree of accuracy. So moving on to functional impairment, um, the uh, authors noted a decrease in lactospiraceae and ruminococcaceae in alcohol-associated hepatitis. Uh, the reason these families are important is they are critical for the synthesis of short-chain fatty acids, which we talked about, uh, are important for gut luminal integrity and the uh, mediation of infl the inflammatory response. Concordantly, uh, when measuring uh, fecal short-chain fatty acids, uh, there was a decrease in the presence of short-chain fatty acids as you moved across from he heavy, heavy drinking controls to severe alcohol-associated hepatitis. So the authors reached the following conclusions that the intestinal microbiome may play an important role in the pathogenesis of alcohol-associated hepatitis, and that there were distinctive microbiome changes between heavy drinking controls and alcohol-associated hepatitis. This led to a decrease in alpha biodiversity, decreased inferred functionality in terms of short-chain fatty acid uh, composition, and there was some heterogeneity noted between the groups. The microbiome signature did not discriminate alcohol-associated hepatitis by severity. Moving on, I'm going to highlight a paper from Liver Transplantation, which was a small study, but provocative. Uh, and the title of this paper is Alcohol Consumption on the Day of Liver Transplantation for Alcohol-Associated Liver Disease Does Not Affect Long-Term Survival, a Case Control Study. So some background, as we know, as we see the, the uh, decreasing frequency of liver transplantation for hepatitis C, alcohol-associated liver disease has become the leading indication for liver transplant in the United States and in Europe. Um, Multiple studies have demonstrated that post-liver transplant relapse to alcohol use is associated with decreased survival, particularly when it's harmful. Um, many programs previously held fixed sobriety intervals prior to liver transplant and ALD. Typically, that was a six-month uh, interval or the quote-unquote six-month rule. Uh, but as evidence has uh, accumulated that uh, well-selected patients with limited abstinence can do well after liver transplant, these intervals are being increasingly abandoned. So they, the purpose of this study was to determine if patients who had a blood uh, or urine alcohol level on the day of liver transplant had an impaired survival or increased alcohol relapse after liver transplantation. Uh, 
This was a retrospective multi-center case control study uh, out of France. Um, they uh, included patients with a positive alcohol test on the day of liver transplant and matched them with two controls uh, during the same trimester at a single center. They did uh, perform a sensitivity analysis to exclude patients who had a weekly positive uh, alcohol test in the possibility they might have been a false positive. Uh, and then for defining post-transplant alcohol use, uh, they defined it as any use that came to clinical attention. Um, they uh, compared survival by Kaplan-Meier analysis uh, and a Cox proportional hazard model regression, and then they made a multivariable model, uh, including variables with a p-value of less than 0.2. So uh, across the centers, they identified 50 patients who had alcohol use on the day of liver transplantation. Uh, the medium serum alcohol level was 0.4 grams per liter. Of that 50 patients, 42 uh, subsequently did undergo liver transplant on that same admission. And that was out of roughly 3,000 liver transplants performed during the entire study period. Uh, eight patients were denied liver transplant due to that positive alcohol level uh, with a median melt of 14. Uh, all of them had a clearly positive alcohol level of, a of 0.5 or greater, suggesting these were not a false positive. Uh, four of these patients did eventually get transplanted. Uh, two of them relapsed afterwards, but all were still alive at last follow-up. Uh, the four patients that did not undergo liver transplant all died. So of the 42 cases and 84 match controls, they were similar except the cases were older, uh, had more hepatitis C co-infection, uh, and were more likely to have steatosis on explant. No patient had evidence of steatohepatitis on explant, however. Follow-up was fairly long at a median follow-up of 12 years, which was comparable between cases and controls. Seven patients did require retransplantation. Uh, in terms of clinical events, uh, there were more deaths numerically uh, in the cases as opposed to controls, and more uh, cases did develop recurrent cirrhosis. Alcohol use was likewise more common uh, in the cases than controls, although 40% of the cases who had a positive alcohol level on the day of transplant had no evidence of alcohol use after transplant. In terms of sustained excess consumption, which they defined as harmful drinking more than three drinks per day, uh, there was no difference uh, between the cases and controls. Uh, in their survival analysis, uh, there was no difference on log rank uh, in, their, uh, in the survival between the cases and controls. Uh, their univariate predictors of survival included retransplantation, post-transplant malignancy, and sustained alcohol, cons or excuse me, um, um, uh, and retransplantation. Uh, on their Cox proportional hazard model, uh, only retransplantation uh, was associated with in uh, inferior survival um, after transplant. In their sensitivity analysis, alcohol use uh, after liver transplant was still not associated with mortality. So their conclusions uh, is that patients with alcohol use on the day of liver transplant did not have impaired post-liver transplant survival when compared to matched controls. Uh, patients with alcohol use uh, did use alcohol more frequently uh, and were more likely to develop recurrent cirrhosis, but it was not um, uh, alcohol use was not in, associated with uh, post-liver transplant survival. So I think this uh, manuscript is provocative in the sense that, you know, there's been a lot of questions asked about, you know, how we select patients for liver transplant with alcohol-associated liver disease, and frankly, whether or not we have the ability to really distinguish who's going to consume alcohol harmfully after liver transplant and who isn't. So I included this just for the, the, the nature of the provocative nature of it. And um, um, it certainly asks a, a lot of questions about uh, the process. Finally, I'm gonna review a paper from Hepatology Communications. Uh, and this is uh, entitled Alcohol Use and Long-Term Outcomes Among Jewish Veterans Who Received Direct Acting Antivirals for Hepatitis C Treatment. So as we know, uh, alcohol use in the presence of uh, really any viral hepatitis has a synergistic effect in the progression of liver disease, and that with the advent of direct acting antiviral therapy, that they are well tolerated and highly efficacious. What is unknown is how alcohol use before and after direct acting antiviral therapy impacts the risk of development of end-stage liver disease and hepatocellular carcinoma. It is also unknown if direct acting antiviral therapy impacts drinking behavior. So this was a retrospective study amongst U.S. veterans that underwent hepatitis C treatment. Um, they needed to have complete follow-up with a sustained viral response documented. Uh, patients needed to have an alcohol use disorders identification test consumption, also known as the audit C test, within one year before DAA therapy. 
Uh, and then they assessed audit scores uh, every three months or at least three months after post-DA therapy to assess progression of drinking behavior. Uh, the outcomes of interest are typical interests in cirrhosis, which is uh, the development of end-stage liver disease, hepatocellular carcinoma, transplant, and death. Uh, and they made these diagnoses using ICD codes. So just to uh, refresher about the uh, audit C, uh, it asks three questions. How often do you have a drink containing alcohol? How many standard drinks of alcohol do you have on a typical day? And how often do you have six or more drinks on a single occasion? It scored from zero to 12. Zero is non-drinking, one to three was, is considered low level, and four or more is uh, unhealthy drinking. Uh, so they used a multivariable Cox pro pro uh, proportional regression to determine associations between the severity of pretreatment alcohol use and mortality. Uh, they modeled changes in audit C over time to determine the impact and changes of behavior. Uh, and then they included uh, adjusted for numerous variables that uh, may be associated uh, with alcohol use and poor outcomes. Uh, and none of them are terribly surprising, uh, including comorbid uh, viral hepatitis, other comorbidities, markers of liver function, and pre-existing cirrhosis. Uh, there were 29,000 patients included uh, in this study, uh, as it expected with a, uh, a um, study of veterans, 97% were male at a mean age of 61 years. Uh, most of the uh, study uh, uh, patients were either non-Hispanic white or non-Hispanic black. Uh, about a third had uh, pretreatment cirrhosis. Uh, those who had unhealthy drinking uh, prior to uh, direct acting antiviral therapy tended to be younger. Uh, non-Hispanic white, a lower BMI, a lower rate of diabetes, other substance abuse. Uh, they had a higher rate of other substance abuse. Uh, they had a lower proportion of a meld greater than nine and lower comorbidities. The non-drinking patients did have a higher rate of HCC and a higher rate of cirrhosis. So they discovered that although the numbers were small, there was a decrease in harmful drinking behavior after uh, direct acting antiviral therapy. Um, as you can see here, the proportion of patients that uh, went, went on to become non-drinking uh, increased across uh, uh, all arms here. Uh, and then the proportion of patients who drank in an unhealthy manner decreased across all these different uh, subsets, including SVR, no SVR, cirrhosis, and no cirrhosis. Uh, in terms of uh, associating alcohol use with adverse outcomes, um, as you might expect, unhealthy drinking, uh, even with uh, direct acting antiviral therapy, uh, is associated with worse outcomes on both unadjusted and adjusted uh, hazard ratios. So mortality, as you can see here, unhealthy drinking, um, the uh, confidence intervals here are all significant for decompensated cirrhosis as well. Uh, patients who had low-level drinking or unhealthy drinking were less likely to get liver transplantation. I suspect that's probably related to institutional rules. Um, and then liver transplantation or death was uh, only unhealthy drinking was associated with uh, either bad outcome. Uh, as you can see here on survival curves, uh, that uh, unhealthy uh, drinking was uh, uh, inversely uh, associated with the probability of survival. Um, in terms of the other outcomes, the uh, association is not significant. Uh, with the adjusted risk of death um, by SVR and cirrhosis, you can see here that under most of these uh, subgroups, uh, unhealthy drinking um, is uh, associated with worse outcomes, uh, including mortality with, if you don't achieve SVR. Uh, but even if you do, uh, in this case, uh, unhealthy drinking uh, increases your risk of death. So really, uh, ongoing alcohol use uh, is a risk factor, even if hepatitis C is eradicated. So they, in conclusion, determined that unhealthy alcohol use is associated with the increased risk of mortality uh, and decompensated cirrhosis, even after SVR in a large population of American veterans. Uh, they did note a small decrease in unhealthy drinking after hepatitis C treatment, suggesting that hepatitis C treatment may be an opportunity for intervention. And so it's important when uh, people see patients with viral hepatitis or NAFLD um, or any other comorbid liver disease that alcohol use is assessed due to its synergistic effects in leading to cirrhosis and decompensation. So in conclusion, um, there are distinct uh, microbiota profiles seen in both heavy drinkers and in patients with alcohol-associated hepatitis, and the microbiome profile can predict the presence of alcohol-associated hepatitis but not disease severity. 
Population changes, decreased alpha biodiversity, and microbiome functional impairment uh, may be involved in the pathogenesis of alcohol-associated hepatitis and could be uh, uh, an avenue for potential therapeutics. Um, a positive alcohol level on the at the time of liver transplantation was not associated with impaired post-liver transplant survival. Uh, the optimal selection of candidates with ALD for uh, liver transplant remains somewhat uncertain uh, due to the unpredictability of alcohol use disorders natural history. Uh, and then finally, unhealthy alcohol use is associated with worse outcomes after uh, hepatitis C treatment with direct acting antiviral therapy. And that's it. I want to say thank you to uh, the organizers uh, and the editors for the invitation. Uh, th thank you, doc Dr. Rice. Um, so from alcohol fever disease, now we are moving on to cirrhosis. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Elliot Tepper, who is director of the cirrhosis program at the University of Michigan, um, where he is assistant professor. He completed his uh, GI uh, fellowship training at the Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital at Harvard University. And his current research aims to prevent the complications of cirrhosis through improved risk stratification, quality improvement, and clinical trials. He's excited to speak today on the recent advances in quality improvement. Dr. Tepper. Thank you very much for a great introduction. So I'm going to talk about cirrhosis quality and start by saying I'm thankful to these great journals for giving a space for this kind of research. I have some conflicts of interest that I'll remind you of as they become pertinent. So I just wanted to frame our discussion in a definition of quality that focuses on this formula, where anything that increases the value for the patient defined by something that extends their life or improves their well-being is is uh, clearly that it's gonna improve quality and anything that reduces the cost of the care that gets us to that target will also improve quality. Typically, people think about quality as a checklist of things that we do to patients and for, in some cases, it kind of is, but there's a lot more to that and that's what some of the papers in the past year have really borne out. But to remind you of that sort of classic view of quality, the process measures. We're doing ultrasounds to screen for liver cancer. We're doing endoscopy at an interval to find about the patient's present status so about one to three years or frequently after they bleed. We're prescribing medications to prevent complications. We're trying to avoid preventable illnesses through vaccinations. And once you know the research that has established these things, it forms a set of things that you have to work through as you see patients. And uh, quality often looks at the rate at which we uh, provide that kind of care. So a classic quality paper in hepatology communications led by a Dr. Kardashian looked at the rate at which providers in one single center in Los Angeles actually met those process measures. And what we find is that while it seems easy, we're not doing the best job. So I'm gonna highlight a couple of things here. So the first is that the rate at which patients are getting, uh, uh, getting uh, ultrasound screening for liver cancer is 24%. That's what they find here. It's what's been seen in other studies. Clearly, even in one great referral center, we are failing to miss the mark. And amongst patients who had a variceal bleed, where we are paid to do the endoscopy to eradicate their varices, we are only bringing back one out of 45 patients for a timely endoscopy. And we know that if your patient is so fortunate to survive an episode of SBP, then we have to prevent the next one with antibiotics, but here only one in five patients are getting that treatment. So clearly we need a kind of science that works on linkage to care for those uh, patients who would benefit from those process measures, which brings me to the next paper, from the same group, this time led by Dr. Lizzie Abbey, uh, where they asked the question, how are we going to get that screening test uh, for that patient at risk for liver cancer? So they go through the charts of every single person within their catchment area in this one uh, center, uh, this time a Veterans Affairs Hospital, and they find people with known cirrhosis. And then they reach out to them through a combination of letters and phone calls. And of the people that they're able to reach and schedule that appointment, they get screening in 72% of patients. 60% get it in a timely fashion within six months. Huge leaps forward from what they saw in the center across the street. But I'll remind you that 87 people didn't pick up the phone. 
And so we have to come up with additional strategies that link people to care through more than just uh, phone calls and letters. And although this group didn't look at uh, liver cancer, they show you a way forward. So this is a paper, again, in Hepatology Communications, which focuses on a multimodal approach of linking people to effective care. We know that we should be screening for hep C. We know that we have super powerful drugs that can cure this virus and save countless lives. But how are you going to find the people that could benefit from it? So what this group did is they reached out to a variety of hospitals over 2014 to 2018, and they started to educate the doctors through webinars and case-based telemedicine. They reached out to patients with brochures in the waiting rooms, and then they created prompts within the electronic medical record that, that focused the, uh, the provider's attention on the need to screen for hepatitis C at the point of care. What did they find? Well, here's a graph that shows you each successive bar is uh, the next year. And over time, what you see is the rate of people who were screened for hepatitis C uh, amongst baby boomers uh, rose substantially. Clear improvements, but still, even for screening, only hitting about uh, one in two people. So what is the result of that screening? So in the left-hand side of this graph, you can see that in 2015, they diagnosed about 45 people with active viremia, 210 uh, were cured. And you might say, 2014 is just the beginning of DMV. Well, 2008, you're diagnosing a lot of people, but still uh, less than half of them are going to be cured of their hepatitis C. When you cobble the data together, what you see is that in the cascade of care, even though we're making significant strides in identifying people with hepatitis C, we are only curing less than half. And the biggest drop off here is simply a linking that person who has a diagnosed virus to the prescription of the drug, which once that happens, you know they're going to be cured. What's it going to take to close those gaps? Hopefully I'll tell you about that in a similar talk next year. So this is a paper, and I, I hate to toot my own horn, but this is a paper in hepatology published by uh, Dr. Mary Thompson uh, from my group, where she took a database, this is administrative data, hundreds of thousands of people with cirrhosis, and she looks at only people who have decompensated cirrhosis in this commercial claims database, and asks the question, how well are we doing with medication reconciliation? How well are we making sure that people's medicines are refilled? This is not a new drug. It's not a new genotype. It's the most boring stuff of clinical care, but it's clearly the most important. So people with ascites, we are, we are prescribing diuretics. People with HE, we're prescribing lactulose. But how frequently are we doing it so that they have enough at home throughout the course of the year? And the numbers are shocking. Only 4.6% of people with known hepatic encephalopathy have enough lactulose at home to last them several months. Uh, the same, we, we find similar results with non-selective beta blockers. So people who had bleeds, only 8% of them have pills at home uh, for, uh, for secondary prevention consistently. So if you did this kind of uh, medication reconciliation and you found out what your patients were taking, you would improve their quality of care, and you'd probably be surprised at some of the other things that you learn. So whereas we're terrible at prescribing beta blockers and lactulose, we're very good at refilling proton pump inhibitors, which might help reflux for some people, but may be unnecessary in many, increasing the risk perhaps of encephalopathy, SVP. And we're refilling opioids, benzodiazepines, and we are prescribing NSAIDs. We're prescribing Advil, Motrin, et cetera, for people that have decompensated cirrhosis. So not only are we prescribing too few good meds, we're prescribing too many bad meds. So here's a point where I'm going to expand the definition of quality a little bit, uh, where uh, we, we look at exactly what we're measuring when it comes to liver transplants. So this is a paper in liver transplantation where uh, they review the kinds of outcomes that each of the centers in the United States are producing. So typically what we're measuring is survival after, uh, within one year after transplant, and we tailor our care to that. But what matters to patients? What matters to them is how long they live once they've been listed. Once you've been transplanted, you, you've, you've got it made uh, for, uh, pr pretty well, but they want to be transplanted. They want to survive when they've been listed. So let's look at how well 
our centers are doing. So on the y-axis of this curve uh, is the distribution across centers. So we've got hundreds of centers that are doing liver transplant, and each number is the percentage of, of, of uh, centers. And on the x-axis, you have the overall survival rates. So the dashed line here uh, towards the right-hand side of this shows you how we are tightly clustering around 90% to yield uh, survival after transplant. So clearly this tells you some center is doing better than others, but it also tells you that we're measuring the statistic and people are responding to that and we are providing care commensurate with the expectations from our regulators. But then if you look at intention to treat, the people who were listed for liver transplant, one, it clusters around 80% and there's far more patients, far more centers that are performing more poorly where there are many centers where the average patient has a one-year survival between 60 and 75 percent. And what this tells you is that there's probably gross unmet needs for decompensated cirrhosis care across this country and probably value for patients in, uh, in measuring that. So again, getting at value here, ask a patient what matters to them. And clearly survival matters, but they want to thrive. So this is data from the SPLIT consortium. These are people who are doing transplants for kids. And the gray lines tell you about how well patients are doing at one year, and the black lines tell you about uh, the third year. And each of these categories deals with one, overall quality of life, two, school functioning, three, cognitive function. And what you can see here is that half of kids are falling behind in school. 60% of kids have poor cognitive function after transplant. Clearly we want them to survive, but we also want them to live long and productive lives. And this kind of research, it uncovers the unmet needs probably in the ill effects of immunosuppression uh, for transplantation. And it leads the way forward for translational type research. Here's uh, a paper in hepatology that gives us some benchmarks for complications. Uh, if a patient experiences a complication of an endoscopic procedure, obviously that's, that's regrettable. Uh, some of that is part of the territory, but if you are having more complications than you'd expect, then that should require a deep dive in how you provide care. So this is led by a Dr. Sarah Lieber currently at, uh, in, in Dallas, Texas, and she gets a database of all procedures in the United States that were performed with anesthesia support. And what she finds is that here are the rates of complications, 0.04% death, uh, 1% any kind of complication. And so what this provides for you is a safety benchmark if you are motivated to be introspective and ask what exactly is happening to patients in your care. This kind of data is, is absolutely necessary to understand how you're doing relative to expectations. So I'll close with one more paper from our group published in Hepatology, where we ask the question of not only are we providing high quality care, but who in the care team is providing the highest quality care. So we call nurse practitioners, physician assistants, advanced practice providers. In other countries, they might be called uh, clinical nurse uh, specialists. Uh, and um, uh, in what we find in, uh, in our uh, administrative database is that roughly half of patients with cirrhosis are seen by an advanced practice provider at some point. And what happens if you set up a natural experiment where you follow a patient for two years and smack in the middle of those two years, a patient with cirrhosis sees an advanced practice provider for the first time, then that person is more likely to be screened for liver cancer, more likely to be screened for varices, and they're more likely to be prescribed rifaximin after an episode of encephalopathy on lactulose, and I have a conflict of interest with that company. And what this tells you is that there are people amongst us on the care team that are probably more careful uh, with the care that they're providing, more diligent or thorough, perhaps. And uh, this is uh, a, an example of the power of uh, collaboration with people like advanced practice providers, uh, clinical nurse specialists. So not only is the care that they're providing uh, more likely to yield those process measures, but it's actually associated with improved survival. Well, it's not causation necessarily, but it's not not causation. So if you look at what happens when a patient sees a patient, sees a, an advanced practice provider, the hazard ratio for death is lower 
that's without adjusting for comorbidities. If you adjust for comorbidities, severity of disease, location of practice, the hazard ratio gets better. If you adjust for the competing risk of liver transplantation, the same. If you conduct a propensity matched analysis where you try to recapitulate the terms of a randomized trial by balancing the covariates as much as you can on either side, then in this case, advanced practice provider care is even, it looks even better. And then if you start the follow-up clock at a landmark of the diagnosis of cirrhosis, the most conservative uh, database assessment that you can do, you still have improved overall survival. So it, it might not be causative, but it definitely shows that it's safe. And it shows that if, you, if someone specializes exclusively in clinical care for cirrhosis, they're going to improve overall outcomes. So th these have been great papers in uh, quality improvement in ASLD journals. Very thankful that they've given a space. And what they remind you is that there are things that we should be doing for patients. There are benchmarks for how much we should be doing that uh, uh, would lead us to think about changes in care, that we should also define quality in terms of those hard outcomes to survival, but also expand that definition to focus on the well-being of patients as the split consortium did. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, fantastic. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce the final speaker in what has really turned out to be a fascinating mini symposium, uh, Dr. Jennifer Alai, who is a general and transplant hepatologist and associate professor of medicine at UCSF. Her mission is to improve the lives of patients with end-stage liver disease at an individual level and at a system-wide level through clinical investigation and uh, dissemination of research. Her research really lies at the intersection of hepatology, liver transplant, and geriatrics, looking uh, in particular at aging research principles. She is the principal investigator of the NIH Multicenter Functional Assessment in Liver Transplant or Frailty Study, and serves as director of the UCSF Advancing Research in Clinical Hepatology or, Hepatol or ARCH program. She earned her undergraduate degree from Stanford and an MD MBA from Tufts. She completed her residency at uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital Columbia, where I had the good fortune of serving as her research mentor, but unfortunately lost her back to the West Coast where she completed GI Transplant Hepatology Fellowship at UCSF, where she has remained. She is a fellow of the AST, an associate editor for the, for the journal AJT, and on the editorial board for Hepatology and LT. She currently serves as a standing member on the FDA GI Drug Advisory Committee. Uh, Jen, welcome. Great, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thanks so much for that uh, kind introduction, uh, Dr. Brown. Okay, great. I have no financial conflicts of interest that are relevant to this talk. So there were so many outstanding and rigorously conducted articles that were published in the AASLD suite of journals in 2020, um, particularly related to the topic of liver transplantation, but I wanted to make sure that the few articles that I chose represented the full continuum of transplant care in service of what I believe is really the primary goal of research in liver transplantation, which is to optimize transplant related outcomes. And so today I'm going to be covering articles in these uh, domains of, of uh, liver transplantation, which is improvements in risk prediction, pre-transplant management strategies, donor liver options, and post-transplant management strategies. Let's start with improvements in risk prediction. This was an article published by Dr. Azrani and his team at uh, Baylor Dallas uh, covering the topic of meld grail sodium. The, uh, as we all know, meld sodium is a well-established metric of mortality in patients with cirrhosis. It is so good that it's actually used for liver allocation and prioritization of liver transplant candidates in um, many areas, including the United States. 
But one of the problems is that creatinine underestimates renal dysfunction in patients with cirrhosis, which is not so much of a problem if it did so uh, uniformly across all patients with cirrhosis, but it does so differentially, in, particularly in women and high acuity patients. So creatinine will underestimate the degree of dysfunction of uh, kidneys. So the, this uh, Dr. Azrani and his team asked, does replacement of the serum creatinine into meld sodium with an estimated GFR improve prediction of waitlist mortality? So he used data from the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients from 2014 to 2015 on US waitlist candidates for liver transplant alone. And what he did was he uh, repl essentially replaced the creatinine component in melt sodium with an estimation of uh, GFR using GRAIL, which his team developed. And GRAIL can be, you can actually just Google GRAIL and find the calculator. And it, 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 it's um, a, a EGFR calculation uh, that is estimated from age, sex, African-American race, creatinine, BUN, and serum albumin. Now, they, uh, their cohort consisted of about uh, 8,000 patients in 2014, 8,000 patients in 2015 with a median list meld of 17 and a three-month mortality rate of 4.3%. So about 370 uh, deaths in each year as their primary outcome. And here you can see uh, the 90, rates of 90-day mortality in uh, what was observed. So that's the black bar. The dark gray bar in the middle is uh, the predicted deaths at three months using the meld grail sodium and the light gray bar on the right is the predicted uh, rates of death uh, using meld sodium alone. And what we're looking for is for either the middle bar or the far right bar uh, to match up with the observed bar with the dark gray bar on the, or sorry, the dark black bar on the left. And you can see here that in their entire cohort, meld grail sodium begins to outperform meld sodium when the meld sodium is greater than 27. So exactly what's hypothesized, that if we think that serum creatinine really underestimates creatinine in high acuity patients, well, that's what we're seeing here, that at meld sodium, this is where you start, at a meld sodium of 27 or higher, this is where you see meld grail uh, outperform meld sodium. And then in women, it's the, the shift actually happens a little bit earlier at a meld sodium of 23 um, or higher is when meld sodium start, meld grail sodium starts to outperform meld sodium. And so the key takeaway here is that not only is meld grail sodium a better predictor of mortality at higher meld scores, but incorporation of meld grail sodium into liver allocation may reduce overall waitlist mortality and importantly, reduce the gender gap in waitlist mortality, which is something that has plagued the liver transplant field for uh, decades. So moving on to pre-transplant management strategies. Um, let's talk a little bit about terlipressin. So terlipressin and albumin combination improves um, outcomes in patients with hepatorenal syndrome. But we also know that um, in patients with cirrhosis and hepatorenal syndrome, liver transplantation is ultimately the best therapy to reverse and prevent uh, HRS. Um, and the peritransplant response to terlipressin and albumin and the benefit of terlipressin and albumin has not really been fully characterized in the context of liver transplantation. And so the question that these investigators in Italy asked was, what is the effective response to terlipressin and albumin on transplant outcomes, both before and after transplant? Uh, they used data from a single center in Italy um, of liver transplant candidates who presented to their hospital with acute kidney injury from hepatorenal syndrome over a four-year period from 2012 to 2016, who were treated with terlipressin and albumin, all of whom were treated with these medications, um, and this was a retrospective review of records. And their primary predictor was response to terlipressin and albumin as defined 
by a decrease in serum creatinine to less than 0.3 milligrams per deciliter of the baseline, or from the baseline, I should say. And the primary outcomes were liver transplant-free survival, time to liver transplant, and post-transplant renal outcomes. So let's talk about the pre-transplant outcomes. So here you can see that there were 82 uh, patients included in their cohort. So not a huge uh, cohort, but a good start uh, to give us a sense of, of what kind of data we can expect in the future. And 43 or about half of the cohort responded to terlipressin and albumin, and the other half did not respond. And you can see the characteristics of those who responded were different um, than those who didn't respond. So serum creatinine was lower in those who responded than didn't respond. MELD was slightly lower as expected. And the proportion with very high MELDs is defined by greater than 35 uh, was significantly lower in those who were who responded. So they were slightly healthier um, among those who responded. And this uh, Kaplan-Meier curve shows the uh, transplant-free survival. You can see, as expected, that those who responded to terlipressin and albumin had a better uh, transplant-free survival than those who didn't respond, which is what we would expect because we know HRS is, is uh, bad for patients. Now let's look at the post-transplant outcomes, which is the much more um, interesting um, uh, interesting analysis. So uh, not everybody went to transplant, so 60 patients went to transplant. And after transplant, those who responded had um, no, no need for renal replacement therapy after transplant. Now, interestingly, rates of infection were very, very high, um, but uh, there was no, no significant difference in the rates of ICU stay among uh, responders and non-responders. Uh, total length of stay, however, was significantly lower in those who responded to terlipressin and albumin than those who didn't respond. Um, and here was the cumulative incidence of chronic kidney disease after liver transplant. And you can see that those who responded to terlipressin and albumin had significantly lower rates of chronic kidney disease than those who did not respond to terlipressin and albumin going into transplant. And so the key takeaway here is that response to terlipressin and albumin is associated with a decreased need for post-transplant renal replacement therapy as well as CKD. Continuing on with the theme of post-transplant, pre-transplant management strategies, let's move on to portopulmonary hypertension. So we know that untreated portopulmonary hypertension has a poor prognosis and that vasomodulator therapies for portopulmonary hypertension are more effective, um, are getting more effective than they used to be um, a decade ago and are also easier to administer because now there are oral therapies. We also know that liver transplant may improve outcomes for portopulmonary hypertension, but that liver transplantation in the advanced stages of portopulmonary hypertension may compromise post-transplant outcomes. Um, and so because of this tension, liver transplant for portopulmonary hypertension uh, as a primary indication remains controversial. I think our selection of patients with cirrhosis and portopulmonary hypertension for liver transplant um, remains still unclear. So this was a really excellent study published in Hepatology, systematic review and meta-analysis of 26 studies um, with a selection criteria of including at least over five patients each. Seven of the studies included both patients who received vasomodulator modulator therapy alone, as well as other patients who received vasomodulator therapy and liver transplantation as a treatment. And overall, there were over a thousand patients included in this systematic review. Um, when we look at the patients who received vas vasomodulator therapy alone versus vasomodulator therapy and liver transplantation, you can see there were big differences. The mean, the, 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 the patients who received liver transplant in addition to vasomodulator therapy for portopulmonary hypertension were sicker, as expected, had a higher mean MELD of 19, and, and many more child B and C patients as compared to a lot more child A patients in the vasomodulator alone therapy group. Post-diagnosis, not transplant, but diagnosis um, after port a diagnosis of portopulmonary hypertension, you can see here, interestingly, at one and three years after diagnosis, the two groups are actually quite similar, and it's only at five years after diagnosis um, do they start to diverge. And so really, you know, in the early stages of um, portopulmonary hypertension, um, liver transplantation doesn't, doesn't seem to offer a lot of benefit. Um, among those who underwent liver transplantation, 
presentation, you can see here that these are the rates of uh, one year, three year, and five year survival. Notably, um, one year survival was 80%, um, so not quite this 85% metric that I think um, is the generally accepted one year survival uh, rate for um, acceptable outcomes. And then five year survival was 67%. Again, shy of the 75% five year benchmark that I think a lot of uh, centers really aim for. Um, the uh, when it, when looking at secondary endpoints, um, uh, which were you know mean pulmonary artery pressure and PBR um, and and uh, cardiorespiratory function, uh, really both therapies were effective in improving those metrics. Uh, but it's really interesting that deaths attributed to attributable to progressive cardiopulmonary hypertension and right heart failure versus other causes like liver failure were still very high in both groups, even among among those who underwent liver transplantation, 55% died of complications related to um, their cardiopulmonary um, condition. So the key takeaway here is that vasomodulator therapy and vasomodulator therapy plus liver transplantation are both effective therapies for portopulmonary hypertension, um, but patients with child B and C cirrhosis plus portopulmonary hypertension have better survival with liver transplantation alone. But I think the controversy um, and the more provocative finding is, um, what do we do with the child A patients? Do they really benefit from liver transplantation? Uh, Five-year post-transplant survival was 67%. Only 50% total were able to discontinue vasomodulator therapy after liver transplantation. Moving on to donor liver options. Macrosteatosis has been shown to be associated with worse post-liver transplant outcomes. We all know that. Um, we do know that, and as a result, uh, there is decreased utilization of macrosteatotic livers, um, accounting for about a quarter of um, the reasons why livers are discarded. But we are going to, as a community, we have to learn how to use these livers because of an increasing number of obese donors. If we don't learn how to use them, um, and if we don't understand the outcomes associated with these livers, and we're going to be missing a lot of potential opportunities to transplant um, with these livers. And so this really interesting article published in Liver Transplantation this summer uh, asked the question, well, what happens to the fat in a macrosteatotic liver after liver transplant? transplantation. So this was a single center study of 70 liver transplant recipients of livers with moderate macrosteatosis defined as 30 to 60 percent fat. Uh, protocol liver biopsies were conducted at one week and at six months post-transplant. So one of the caveats is the patients had to survive to six months in order to be included in this study. And all biopsies were read by a single experienced uh, pathologist. Now, as expected, so among the 70 patients, as expected, um, there were very high rates of post uh, reperfusion syndrome with these livers, so about a third of patients. A lot of patients met criteria for early allograft dysfunction. Renal uh, Rates of renal replacement therapy after transplant were high. Um, rates of ischemic cholangiopathy, um, in, interestingly in this group, were low, but it was a relatively short follow-up period of only six months. What was so fascinating is that here is the uh, per, uh, the percent of macrosteatosis at uh, the the at implantation, but then within one week after transplant, the fat went away, and that continued at six months post transplant. So the key takeaway here is that moderate macrosteatosis in liver allografts reverses completely as early as seven days after liver transplant. And strategies that reduce risk of post-perfusion syndrome, such as liver machine perfusion, which is really gaining acceptance everywhere and worldwide, um, and also management of the immediate post-liver transplant complications with fatty livers may help to expand the use of these livers. So this was a very interesting study that I hope will encourage our use um, of these livers in the future. Uh, now covering post-transplant management strategies, um, opioid use both pre and post transplant is associated with adverse outcomes after liver transplantation. Uh, we do also know that enhanced recovery after surgery protocols are effective in reducing post-surgery opioid use. Uh, 
So, th so these investigators uh, asked, can an opioid minimization protocol reduce, um, decrease perioperative and post-discharge opioid requirements? This was a single center uh, evaluation of an opioid minimization protocol for liver transplant recipients uh, in 2019 and compared to pre-implementation controls in 2018, and only opioid naive patients were eligible. So here was the opioid minimization protocol. In the pre-transplant setting, there was a large patient education uh, program in which the surgeon discussed pain management expectations uh, with the patient. And on the day of the surgery, they got non-opioid medications. Intraoperatively, the patients received opioid sparing anesthesia, as well as an injection of bupivacaine into the incision at the start of the case. Post-operatively, in the one-day period post-operatively, uh, they did get a hydromorphone PCA, but this was discontinued. And then after uh, 24 hours, the patients received Tylenol standing, gabapentin standing, and then tramadol PRN. It was only if they still had a lot of pain after max dose of tramadol were they given oxycodone. And then on discharge, oops, I'm sorry, they didn't get the hydromorphone PCA on discharge. They didn't get any opioids after discharge. 81 patients of the about 100 patients in the protocol uh, actually uh, stayed on the protocol. So, so only 16 patients failed. And you can see the characteristics of those who failed. They were younger, more likely to be female, um, but otherwise there weren't other um, characteristics that stood out. And um, you can see that the, the, those who were maintained on the protocol had significantly lower utilization of morphine milligram equivalents. They did not refill their pain medications any earlier. Um, uh, and th when they did refill their medications, they did not, they used significantly less, um, less uh, opioids or morphine milligram equivalents, and they did not refill their medications any longer. So it was actually quite successful. And their pain scores actually were much lower on the, proto on the um, protocol. So at day three, their pain scores were much lower. At discharge, their pain scores were much lower. And importantly, their quality of life um, at, in social functioning and general uh, self-reported quality of life was much higher in the opioid minimization protocol than, the, than on the opioid protocol. So the key takeaway here is that the opioid minimization protocol is feasible and results in similar pain control without greater utilization um, of opioids. And such a protocol may be useful in reducing adverse outcomes associated with opioid use and liver transplantation. And so this is just a small sample of the outstanding articles that were has been, that have been published in uh, the suite of ASLD journals in 2020. Um, and you'll note that each of these articles represent research within a distinct phase of the liver transplant process. And from the provider's perspective, the liver transplant process does indeed represent distinct phases um, from that represent that from diagnosis all the way up through you know wait listing through transplant hospitalization through the post transplant period and Dividing the transplant process of care into these phases is really useful for research because then we have these really easy to measure hard outcomes such as survival in the pre-transplant setting and then survival in the post-transplant setting and graft function. But from the patient's perspective, they don't see it like this. It is one large transplant experience. And the outcomes that they're thinking about and, and the feelings that they have um, about this transplant process are not just about survival, but they really encompass a, a whole range of, of these set, sorts of things. Fear of dying, fear of dependence on their caregiver. What are the side effects of medications? How will I manage all these medications after transplant? What will my relationships be like um, once I get a new liver? And so I wanted to leave you today thinking about a different way of, of, of considering the transplant experience, perhaps from a more patient-oriented perspective, under the framework of survivorship, which is an article, um, a perspective piece that, um, that my team published uh, with uh, Dr. Ufere and Dr. Bukabalas. Um, and survivorship, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, is actually was actually a concept developed in the field of cancer and can, can most succinctly be described as living with through and beyond cancer, and a focus on the overall health and well-being of a person across the continuum of care. I think we can all see how easily it would be to sort of translate this uh, framework into the field of transplant.
Liver transplant survivorship would consider four different domains of well being physical well being, social well being, psychological well being, as well as spiritual well being. And the reason that considering these domains of well being are um, important and, per and, and perhaps a frame shift in the way that we study uh, liver transplantation going forward is that um, under the traditional model uh, of, of considering the distinct phases of the process of liver transplant care, what we, what, what were the outcomes that we study are really about patient survival and graft survival. And, and the methods that we use um, are these traditional methods of, you know, looking at labs and imaging and administrative codes. We do chart review, we do automated data extraction. But if we want to consider this survivorship model and start thinking about, you know, other outcomes that are really more patient oriented, perhaps like frailty, loneliness, quality of life, coping, valued life activities, we have to start applying a different set of research methodologies and also to expand um, the, the types of assessments that we, we uh, use in our cohorts, quality of life assessments, tests of physical function, surveys of patients. Um, and and um, I hope that the future of research in liver transplantation will incorporate a lot more of these kinds of assessments and outcomes in order to capture the full lived experience of a patient uh, with liver transplantation. So in the interest of time, I will just flash these up and I will really thank you for this opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Professor Lai. Um, and thanks to all the speakers. I hope the, um, our Apazo colleagues um, have gotten an appreciation for the broad spectrum of outstanding research that's published in the AASL suite of journals. Um, as with all symposiums, or at least most, we've run over time a little bit. So I'd like to ask our hosts, um, Professor Saren and Omada, whether we should take a representative question from the many good questions in the chat for each of our speakers and have the speakers perhaps answer the rest. Uh, would that be a reasonable approach from your yes, view? Perfectly all right. Perfect. Okay, terrific. All right. Well, I'll start with Professor Kumar. And one has asked, um, uh, in, in the, the, the Nash uh, transplant um, article you had, um, had presented, what were the oldest age of patients that were transplanted? Was there any risk stratification greater than 70 years? So that's a good question. Thank you. Um, so they didn't actually report what the exact range of ages was in that trial. Um, the median age was about 67 to 68 for both groups, the NASH group and the non-NASH group. Um, but they did do additional analysis where they stratified people. And so if you remember, everyone was over the age of 65. Um, and then they did do a stratification with patients from 65 to 69 and then over age 70. And that over age 70 group had 226 patients in it and they still did not see any change in that in their results. Terrific, thank you. Um, and here's a question for Professor Nguyen. There are a number of good questions and I, she is answering some on the fly and that's terrific uh, in the chats and um, uh, Q&A. But, but, but here, just to get your perspective, um, the the, the uh, really question is, do you think the U.S. can catch HPV elimination goal by 2030? So that perhaps can give you a chance to touch on the barriers and opportunities there uh, in your brief answer. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, so as we uh, saw in the uh, examples of Australia, the Australia started out with a diagnosis rate of about almost 50%. Uh, in uh, 2000, early 2000, and uh, on their modeling, they would meet the 80% diagnosis rate by 2030, which is still not the WHO uh, a goal, which is 100%, but 80% is the national goal for Australia. So for the US, even if we set our goal as 80%, um, I'm not sure that we could get there in just 10 years because we start out much lower. So um, our data from uh, the NHANES survey, as well as a commercial uh, 
insurance uh, database that we completed uh, recently too. Of, uh, we basically looked at the diagnosis rate of 153 million U.S. insured population. So these are people with better insurance, uh, and the diagnosis rate is still just uh, 20% uh, by mid-2010, so 2015 or so. So um, uh, starting at a much lower number and uh, seeing little progress uh, or no progress in the past 10 years, uh, it's hard to imagine that we would reach even 80% in 10 years. So uh, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but uh, uh, most likely we are not going to, uh, to, to be able to achieve what Australia is expected to achieve. But uh, hopefully this will um, uh, governize uh, the country and, and we are uh, so that we can try to overcome as much as possible in the coming 10 years. Yes, something about the elimination of the viruses from Tokyo. Yeah. Mata, how are you? I think uh, if you set a, a line like elimination, I don't think uh, CB and HB the same because you got to wait until the vaccination program works until the age 70. Otherwise, you cannot say the eliminations. It's CB, yes, but the, I think 20, 30, no, no way you can get rid of the HB virus, integrated viruses. You got to wait until 2050. Whatever the WHO says, I think the vaccination is the only way you can eliminate. Sorry about the comment. Oh, no, please. Yeah, it's right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Professor Nguyen, thank, thank you so much. I, I just would add, it's a good thing that mask wearing is not part of hepatitis B elimination <laughs> in the United States. Um, so I'm going to turn that over uh, to, to Professor Zabo for, um, uh, uh, for a few, few questions. Um, sure. Th thank you, David. So I think that there was another question for Dr. Uh, Sonal Kumar that was related to the Nash-related fibrosis. And I think the question was that, um, was there any difference in the background uh, related to ethnic uh, groups or, di or different lifestyles or type of uh, diet that these uh, patients had? So yes, thank you. Um, you know, I, I answered this in the chat, but I can answer it live as well. Um, there, we, we do know that genetic and ethnic uh, or environmental risk factors play a role in how much NAFLD you'll see in certain communities and the risk of progression. Um, and with regards to the, the study that looked at um, the regional differences in, the, in, the, in NAFLD in China, um, the authors did speculate that there are differences in diet and degree of westernization that accounts for these differences that we saw. Great. Um, Bob, do you have a question? I think you do. For sure. Uh, let me ask a quick question to Elliot, since he's the master of, of using technology to improve quality. Uh, Professor Jashenko points out a really key question that several papers have pointed to poor linkage to care for viral hepatitis. Has the failure to link any hepatitis B and C testing to COVID-19 serologic testing been another public health failing in viral hepatitis? And how would you think if you could design a system, use technology to really fix that? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. And without a doubt, there are people that are in the process of or will fall through the cracks. And so we need at least uh, three things to adapt to it. The first is that there needs to be constant vigilance to monitor through electronic medical records who needs to be tested and who has been tested but has not yet been treated. That is something that we do in the Veterans Affairs. Number two is that uh, this is something that's also been published in liver transplantation as well as hepatology, is about the way that hepatologists ought to embrace telemedicine. The reality is we don't need to see a person in in, in face to face to prescribe them pills. And uh, it, I would feel comfortable in many cases prescribing these medications over the phone. Uh, there are some things that cannot be done uh, through a video visit. Uh, and so we need to have a way of staging people for uh, 
uh, their risk of serotic complications before or after initiating therapy like hepatitis C. And the truth is that you can wait if on the fiber scan. You just have to make sure that they, they, uh, they book that appointment in six to 12 months. And oftentimes we can get by with serological markers. So I think that there's a host of adaptations that we can do to avoid this sort of thing. And there's going to be a role for research to amplify exactly how many people did fall through the cracks uh, in, the, in, the, in this time. Fantastic. Um, I will note, uh, Professor Colombo, I agree with you. We would have been great to host uh, a cholangiocarcinoma symposium. We'll have to save that for our next joint uh, apostle uh, symposium because hepatobiliary cancers would have been a great additional topic. Jen, um, fantastic as always. As we, you know, you've been at the forefront of trying to expand what quality outcomes are in liver transplantation. And if I could give you all the resources and you wanted to define what the optimal outcome is to go beyond one year survivals, what would you want to measure um, after liver transplantation to grade programs on success? That is such a provocative question. Thank you for asking that. You know, I think what, what my point, particularly with transplant survivorship, is that success is defined differently by the patient. And so I think that what we need to do is have a better understanding of what patients value and how patients themselves define success. There certainly is no doubt that survival has to be, you know, number one, patients want to live a long time, but they want to live well. And we have to understand well, what does well mean? If I had to choose one and put my nickel down, I would choose something related to physical functioning. You know, I think that, I think we could probably all agree that if a patient lives a long time but is completely bedbound or wheelchair dependent, that perhaps the vast majority of patients would not define that as a successful liver transplant, nor would providers define that as a successful liver transplant. So in my opinion, what I think we need to enhance our cohorts with and our research with is, is a, um, a, fuller, a fuller picture of what of, of physical functioning after liver transplant. But I think that this is an important opportunity also to, to um, study and to ask patients uh, what, how they define success in their opinion and what they value so that we can make sure that our cohorts going on in the future, moving forward, actually measure those um, outcomes. Uh, I would probably, I might say that cognitive function is more important than physical function. Um, certainly if you ask, um, you know, uh, Stephen Hawking, he would say that you can do a lot with a functioning brain, um, no matter where you're, you find yourself. But um, certainly functional return um, is, is as important, but we can't have, we have to have something that works across all populations because we can't have a system where success is in the eyes of the beholder, you don't want to turn transplant into a big Yelp where we have to get five stars from every reviewer, do you? It's true. And you know what? There's no reason we only have to measure one thing. But I, but to your point, actually, I think I also think cognitive functioning is, is super important. Um, but right now, the, the literature is really focused on survival, right? And so neither your nor my preferred outcomes are being measured and being captured. And so the, the point is, as liver transplantation helps patients survive, we're really good at survival metric. Now we need to move to the next level and start actually measuring physical function and cognitive function. Um, those, those, those outcomes haven't really been captured and characterized fully. All right, thank you, Professor Zabo. Do you have a question for Professor Rice? So um, there are some questions here that are related to the dysbiosis. He, he presented some of the microbiome related uh, um, papers here. And uh, one of the specific questions that came up is that does dysbiosis be responsible for the failure of treatment in patients with viral hepatitis? Uh, 
Um, but uh, you know, this this is not directly related to the alcohol, but definitely it is a major component. And it comes back to I think to the question and to the observations how we know that patients who actively drink alcohol, for example, don't necessarily respond very well to viral therapies. Um, so I wonder if Dr. Lee has any comments here. Uh, I would just say that that, that uh, I think that the story with the microbiome is still in evolution, and that uh, you know some very interesting observations, in, including one that I didn't speak about, uh, that's uh, uh, about patients' uh, decreased drinking behavior uh, who underwent uh, fecal microbiome uh, transplantation. Um, so I think that that uh, there is a lot of provocative observations at this point, um, and. Uh, uh, it really opens the door to therapeutics, uh, but the potential for a microbiome um, manipulation, um, if you will. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think that when you start talking about issues like decreased drinking behavior after uh, microbiota therapy, I mean, it, it almost defies logic. But um, so I think we're opening, we're really at the forefront of, of some a pretty exciting time in, in, in manipulating the microbiome and alternating disease states, not just in alcohol, but across the spectrum of liver diseases. Terrific. Thank you, Professor Rice. Um, so I'd just like to again wrap up with, um, with thanking all the speakers, the participants. It was really our privilege to be able to highlight uh, the journals to you. And I'm going to pass it back to Professor Sarin and Omada for the last word. And again, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. You have to unmute, Professor Sarin. Marine, where are you? Yeah. Uh, Umata. Yeah, okay. So I'm not asking questions to panelists who have been bombarded, but I thought I'll ask the chief editors of the three journals. Just a simple question. Can you pick up the best defining article in your journal in the last two years? I know it's not easy to pick up, it's, but the question is easy. The answer may not be. In hepatology, in uh, communications or in liver transplant, what is your choice? The, the whole session is editor's choice. So can you give us your choice? Uh, uh, well, well, uh, professor, that, that's asking us to say which of our children we love more than the other children. <laughs> <laughs> So the editors, I'm cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Too much. So I, I can I can maybe start saying that I think my choice is the it, it's always easy to tell afterwards because the choice obviously is the is the manuscript that brings in the most citations, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that that is the kind of challenge in in pub, in, in being an editor that uh, sometimes um, you know what your choice is or or based on, based on your personal sort of uh, knowledge and and predictions may not necessarily translate to the most cited articles. Um, so um, certainly we we try to review articles are, are relatively um, predictable in a way that if we choose a topic that uh, hasn't been reviewed in recent years, then typically those do very well. But when it comes to primary original papers, it sometimes can be challenging. Well, may I ask one thing? You know, there might be so many papers from Asia, especially the China, so what's your comments on those papers and what's the recommendation for those coming from Asia? I hope we can get a better papers for Apostle Journal, but uh, uh, obvious people are sending many to your journals. So any comment on that? Well, I, I think that um, we, we, they're all welcome. And I, through my term, I'm, as you know, I'm almost uh, finished with my term. We've tried very hard to, to reach out and, and make sure those papers are welcome. Um, I know that Michael Nathanson before me um, was also very passionate about uh, being open to all, you know, the whole hepatology community and published a very nice piece on, on, on really what the journal is looking for, what the standards are, uh, 
and what the um, and, and, and in both basic and clinical research. Uh, and so, so I do what just while you have so many of your members on, want to really uh, encourage them to submit. Um, we will do the absolute best we can as quickly as we can to find their their hard work a good home in one of our journals. I think a strength of our suite of journals, as you've seen, is that, that there's great work published in all three. So we really do have the capacity to publish good science and hepatology across our whole platform of journals. And I really do want to emphasize that, that, that we're open for business and we really... Uh, we're here, we, you can contact us, all the editors welcome interactions with authors, and, uh, and, and we want your best work uh, to be published in one of our journals. Um, I'll add for me, Ed, I would say that for hepatology communications, being a new journal, uh, certainly we understand that certain institutions and countries put a lot of emphasis on impact factor. And, and uh, obviously, hepatology communication has been in a disadvantage of not, not having an impact factor. Um, at the same time, I would like to thank particularly our Japanese and Australian and Indian colleagues who, in spite of not having impact factor, uh, have submitted many articles. And in fact, we were fortunate to publish many articles from these countries. I think in China, the impact factor existence is an important component. So I'm hoping that uh, hepatology communications will be more at the forefront of choices for, um, for authors coming from across the entire Apostle Society. Oh, glad to hear that. Uh, I mean, better be a crossover, not like America first. Get back to the international consortium. The exchange, hopefully. Well, we've, um, we, we get a, a lot, you know, the excellence in liver surgery across all of Asia. We get great papers from Asia. China actually is second only to the United States in both submissions and number of downloads. Um, South Korea, though, really sets the standard in terms of uh, per capita submissions, um, bypassing uh, India by a long shot. So Shiv, you have some room to move there. Um, and um, and we, could, we would love to have more from both India and Japan. You got to catch your South Korean uh, colleagues in terms of uh, writing. And I would just also take the opportunity to highlight Shiv's own enterprise and in, in outstanding group in their submission rate. I think the submission rate from your group, Shiv, out, outstrips many countries. So, uh, <laughs> and we're, we're just about pen pals in our correspondence and we appreciate your, your submissions uh, and your support and all the others that, that we get. And I also would like to highlight the contributions too of, uh, of the Apostle countries to the response to COVID, the rapidity with which good science and observations came out after uh, in the face of that, uh, you know, newly described disease and, and what is it doing with respect to liver disease and what's the interaction there was sorted out with remarkable uh, pace to the, to, the, to the benefit of patients. And, um, and we had the privilege of receiving and publishing manu these manuscripts, including from uh, the earliest reports um, that, that came out of uh, uh, Asian countries, and, and uh, it really is a testament to um, how, how passionate and quickly uh, the hepatology community can respond to uh, a challenge like that. Well, I would like to uh, profusely thank uh, all the editors, the panelists, and the ASLD for the seminal work, and I would also put my personal salutations to the whole team of hepatology editors. I think we have very benefited and these recordings would be on for many of those our colleagues who have not listened that could not attend the full session. I do hope and pray the science of hepatology knows no boundaries and we can get connected again. Thank you all and thank you David in particular for your leadership and a stellar role in getting this whole meeting and webinar a long webinar organized. Thank you.